today. So I am super excited. Um, I know bits and pieces of your story and I'm excited for you to share that. And I'm gonna let you tell it better. Uh, so will you kind of give them a little bit of your background, how long you've been in the industry? Where do you sell? A little bit about your business. Yeah, so I got into real estate when I was 24 years old. Um, I lived in Southern Maine at the time. Actually, fun fact, David and I are from an area not too far from each other. And we've, no way. Never, we've never met in person and neither of us live in the same area now. Um, <laughs> so both of, us are, both of us are Mainers. Um, so I got into real estate. I was living in Southern Maine at the time and my agent, uh, when I bought my first house, my agent was like, you're really good at this. You should get your license. And 24 year old me had no idea what any of it was going to take. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. So, um, kind of like struggled to find my way for the first couple of years. And then a couple of years in, I made the decision in 2017 that I wanted to move somewhere new. So I'd always lived about 45 minutes from where I grew up, even college, like not that far. So I just packed up and moved to the North shore of Massachusetts. I joined a team there and, uh, God, it's been a lot of moves in my last five years. So I joined a team there um, in late 2017, summer of 2018, they approached me about doing expansion into Boston and I took advantage of the opportunity, moved to Boston and um, about a month before I moved, started doing first time home buyer workshops with my lender. So this team was very like internet pay-per-click lead. And those can take a long time to really nurture and come to fruition. And they were like, you know, you're going to have to get some of your own business uh, in the meantime. So I met this really awesome lender. He was also pretty new to the area. And so he was like, yeah, whatever you want to do, let's do it. So we started doing first time home buyer workshops. And honestly, like it was kind of a hit right away. So um, we were doing them at a local brewery. The first one we had, there was like 30, 35 people there. And then shortly after I moved to Boston, about a month later, everything kind of went to shit, excuse my language, <laughs> with the team I was on. And um, I had no idea that any of this was going on because I was on my own little island in Boston and a bunch of the agents quit, all the admin quit. And they, my rainmaker was like, do you want to stay? Like, we'd love to have you stay, but totally understand if not. And I looked at everything that I had for business at that time. And it was all stuff that came from the buyer workshops. And so wow. I'm like, well, like there's no point in me saying. So uh, fall of 2018, I made the decision to go out on my own. And then it, I've just build, been building my own team since. So I started with a transaction coordinator who was like a contract to close person. That was my first hire, my first piece of leverage. And it was pretty much just him and me for most of the time. 2019 was my first full year in Boston and I did 11.7 million in volume. And that was almost exclusively from the buyer seminars. And then last year I added a showing assistant um, and an executive assistant and my first agent hire. And my production was 23 million last year. And then this year we'll do about 40 million. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm just writing all this down because I know people are going to ask. Um, that's huge. So your first full year on your own, 11.7 million last year, you guys did around 23 million. And then this year on track to do 40, right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Wow. I'm typing that in the chat. Congratulations. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, okay. So what the thing that I've loved about today is everybody has been able to really share something that's worked great for them. And these seminars you have blown it out of the water with. And so I have several questions around them, but first I want to start with when you did the original one, you did them at the brewery and you had like, walk us through how they've evolved and some of the lessons that you've kind of learned and, and, and all the things, just all of it. Yeah, well, I jumped on kind of like 10 minutes before uh, David finished and I heard him say something, which was consistency. Yeah. And I think that is honestly the key to any type of success in real estate. Like whenever I get asked, like, what advice would you give a new agent? It's just pick something and be consistent about it. And I, I think that is really the only reason that I've had so much success with these is I've been really consistent with them. So I... Um, in the beginning, just to kind of walk you through what they looked like, we would have them once a month at a local brewery. So um, every, every like, month. Yeah, so consistent. Okay. So I had a coach that really forced me to track my numbers to make sure that I was like 
measuring every single thing that I did. And then I made a commitment. I'm going to do these like six times and see what happens and then kind of evaluate from there. And at the end of that um, six months, I was having really great success from it. So going into 2019, I planned my entire year based off the numbers that I had been tracking. So every event I would measure how much we would spend in advertising to get people there, how many people would register versus how many people would actually attend. So what was our registration to attendance conversion? And then from there, what was our conversion to clients? So I had everything tracked out and I knew what my numbers would be. What was my average commission? um, What like per event? So if I was getting Like if a certain amount of people attended, I knew I was going to make a certain amount of money. And so going into 2019, I just figured out how many events I wanted to do based on how many houses I wanted to sell, because I had all those metrics that I tracked out for that first six months. Wow. Uh, By the way, uh, Dawn Finch, this is you, you can do that. Like I'm, I'm like, I'm, I, I, I'm like, oh my gosh. Cause I know you and I have kind of talked about this with your uh, bourbon stuff. Okay. So sorry to interrupt. So monthly you started doing them. How did, how did you advertise for them? How did you get the word out? And was it only first time home buyers? Yeah. So it was only first time home buyers, a couple reasons. So one, when I had joined that team, um, outside of Boston and I was making a lot of calls, like I would talk to people and they would just think, I can't afford to buy a house. So we have a pretty high average price point here. Until last year, it was about 450. It's a lot higher now because of the market. But I was meeting people and like single girl going on dates, like meeting people that were my age and hearing like, I can't afford to buy a house. And these are people with good jobs. And I realized there was just a lack of education around what it takes to buy, how little money you actually need, like what you really need to be focusing on is the monthly payment. And we are the third most expensive rental market in the country behind San Francisco, then Manhattan, and then Boston. And so I'm meeting people that are spending $2,500, $2,600 a month on a one bedroom apartment. There's no reason you can't buy a condo. Like that's ridiculous to me. Um, And so people get so focused on the purchase price that they don't look at the numbers and how it actually works out. So I saw this lack of education. So that was part of it. The other part was I wanted to work with people that were kind of around my age that like I felt I just jived a lot better with. And then the third part was strategic. So I went into this with a long game mindset. If I can you know, be the first agent. And Gary says that about 78% of buyers will work with the first agent they meet. So how can I insert myself into the process as early as possible? And a lot of these people- that, I'm so, That's such a great point. I just want to make sure everybody really heard that. 78% of, of consumers will work with the first realtor that they meet. So how strategic of you to say, hey, I'm going to get in from the get-go <laughs> even before they're thinking about it. Exactly. Like I've had people that attended events in 2018 and just bought this year that we've just nurtured that whole time. And after they buy, I'm going to stay in touch with them. Then they're going to sell with me and buy that next house. And I'm going to be their realtor for life. And it's been cool because some of my original clients are now selling and buying that move up property because we've stayed in touch. So it was like a combination of, of different things. And being strategic about it. The other part is just knowing who you are as a person and the way that you operate. So I could make cold calls. We, all we've heard long. that Kimberly so many times today. Don't you guys think we have heard that so many times about doing what is true to you? What, what do you love? It's true. And I could make cold calls all day long. I'm, I like to think I'm really good on the phone. It drains me. I'm an introvert. Like I could do it. I could force myself to do it, but I would hate it. And I would get burnt out after a while. So for me to be able to get in front of a room of people for an hour and a half and talk to a bunch of people at once. And I think the biggest value that I have to give to a consumer is knowledge and education. It just naturally was a fit for me. I love that. I love that so much. Um, Okay. So let's, oh gosh, where do we want to go? Um, and if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, so you asked like a bunch of questions and I really only answered one part of that. Okay. Well, what was your best way of advertising it? Let's go there. Yeah. So I moved to, know that. to a new area where I didn't know anybody at all. So all that we did was Facebook ads. That's, and that's still the only thing that I do. Yes. We're doing some like marketing to our database that I've built up over time, but the majority of the lead capture comes from Facebook ads. Um, before COVID, we would 
advertise, send them to an Eventbrite page, and then they would come to the brewery. We were giving them drink tickets so that they could have a free drink. And it was about an hour and a half in person at a local brewery. Obviously with COVID, we had to, I hate the, this word, but pivot a little bit. Right, right. And um, so now we just do them virtually. We could go back to the brewery at this point, but there's just been the pros of having it virtually outweigh the cons. It's such a time saver, such a cost saver doing it virtually. I also think our engagement has gone up slightly because people aren't as intimidated about asking a question in front of their peers and thinking that they might look stupid. Um, so that's another part of it as well. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask that. So did your attendance increase or decrease when you went virtual? It slightly decreased, but not enough to make a difference. Okay. Okay. Um, do you, so do you think you'll go back to in-person or, or? No, I don't. We're actually working on recording the whole thing. So it becomes an automated class that people love can that. Make it evergreen. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, so when you have the seminar, let's say when you were doing it in person and then we'll do virtual, um, were you mingling most of the time or did you actually like put up a slideshow and give a presentation? Yeah, I, I'm not a mingler. <laughs> that's like my nightmare is any type of mingling. Um, so we originally had a slideshow and it was actually like one time we went and it wouldn't work and then we realized we didn't need it. So what we did was we actually put together booklets. So the first one I did, I noticed like PowerPoint people tune out. So how can you create engagement and keep them interested? The other part of it is that, so we created these booklets. It's got the information, there's areas for fill in the blank, areas for them to take notes, and it's all branded to us. So when these people aren't even thinking about buying a house for a couple of years, like maybe they just really wanna start getting their feet wet, they're taking notes and then they're revisiting those notes in a year or so and all of our information is on there. So mm -hmm. it's also helping them stay engaged as we go and not getting that like zoned out. Yeah, I love that. So then what, how did you do that when you went? Yeah, so in person, we would just like set up all the tables. Everybody would have a booklet, pen. We give them everything that they needed. And then now in, when we do them virtually, we just email the PDF out ahead of time. And I actually have, like, I've had a ton of people say that they print them out and take notes on them. Really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Stephanie had a good idea um, about mailing even the booklet ahead of time. If they register, that'd be nice. You could get their home address. Um, yep. Okay. And so what is some of like the main, well, actually, Teresa, let's go back. I think Teresa had a question. Uh, do you bring a lender or anyone else to the virtual meeting? Yeah, so my lender does it with me and I get this question a lot, like, do you include a home inspector or title, all these different people? I think none of that matters to them. What they really want to know is, can I buy a house? Can I afford to buy a house? And what do I need to do? So don't yeah. overcomplicate it. Don't bring attorneys, title, home inspectors. It's just too much for them. Um, so it's just my lender and I. The cadence is kind of, a, we have like a really good chemistry doing it because I've done it with the same person over a hundred times. So I would say like stick with someone that is charismatic. There's a lot of lenders that are really competent at their job, but they can't talk to a group of people and yep. simplify it enough that it makes sense that they're not getting caught into the weed of, weeds of things. So be careful about who you choose as a lender. Um, so it's my lender and I, I kind of start out by talking about the market, what's going on, what's a buyer's market, what's a seller's market, what are some of the tax advantages of buying, and then my lender goes into a whole segment on pre-approval, what do they look at, what do you need for a credit score, closing costs, all the different components of that, and then we talk about the actual process. So you're sitting here today, like, what do you need to do for the next steps? Love that. Okay. So you start with the, just to recap, because we're getting questions too. Um, you start with a market update about a buyer's market or a seller's market. Talk about the taxes, the tax advantages. Then your lender goes into pre-approval. What can you afford, um, et cetera. And then what was the last thing? Sorry. Um, no, it's okay. We talk about like the steps to buying. So oh, you're yes. here today. What's next? The other part of it is we're always doing a soft close throughout the presentation. I think a lot of people fail to do this. So we're preparing them like, okay, if you're in a 12 month timeline and wanting to make this happen, the next step is to set up an appointment with us so that we can go over your criteria, even if you're not ready to start going out and actively looking. I like to get people into my world and get them into a buyer agency agreement as early as possible. 
Yeah. Even if they end up pushing it out, like it just, it's easier to nurture the relationship that way when they feel committed to you and you have an opportunity to provide them with value over that time. So we'll, we'll set an appointment with anybody that's really like 12 to 18 months out and sign them into a buyer agency agreement. And then we just kind of pitch it as like, you might not be ready to go out and start looking at properties, but what we'll, we'll do is get you set up on a search based on the areas that you're interested in. You'll yeah. be able to start seeing what things are going on the market for and what they're selling for. And by the time you are ready to buy, you're now going to be one of the most educated buyers out there because you're going to see what's been going on and have the proper expectations. I absolutely love that. I think it's genius. And we used to have like this old realtor joke that all people wanted was just to have houses emailed to them anyway. I mean, they just want to. It's so true. It's like America's favorite pastime. It really is. It's so funny because they just want those. They just want to look every day. And I mean, we bought a house in Charleston in December and I'm still on the drip for our agent here. And I, well, one, Heather won't let me delete them because she likes to look at them because she's going to buy a house here hopefully too. But also I still look at them like every day when I get them. I just love the search. I think everyone, everyone does that. Um, okay. Do you, uh, how do you advertise and budget? We hear a lot of people do seminars, but not hear of success too often. Tracy, that's exactly why I brought you the best, Kimberly. Okay, so talk to us about budget. So, um, like I said, everything is Facebook ads. I think the problem is people underspend on their budget. So this is a commitment for me. It, I spend about $500 per event. Um, the way that you determine, so there's actually a little bit of a formula. I'll teach you guys a secret here. The way that you determine how much you should spend is you're going to set up your advertising, you're going to put in your target market, and it will give you a number of people. So your area is probably going to be a lot smaller than mine. In Boston, the potential reach is about 49,000 based on the criteria that I put in. And okay. so you want to take like the first three numbers going, starting at the left. So if it's 49,000, your budget is going to be $490. If oh. your area is like 20,000, you're going to spend $200. So we have, we start the advertising about two weeks out let it run for that time. And we just put a budget for the entire event. So I think a lot of people seriously underspend, but this is a lead gen source. So for yeah. us, um, our average event, we're spending $500 to make about $60,000. Yeah. So it's worth it, right? It's like, you just have to commit to doing it and being consistent with it. Do you know what kind of ads you run that you've had good success with? Um, it's like, it's the same one every time. So oh. I think it's, off the top of my head um it's okay if you is it uh I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head it's just like to target people and then send them to a landing page and that landing page is our event right page okay okay so that sends and them to the, landing. the ad content talks about like there's special financing programs available to oh yeah buyers. I'm sure you guys all have that we have a program called mass housing where you can do zero percent down um, I mean, even like an FHA loan, it's a special financing program available. To yep. Buy. Yep. Okay. I love that. Great, uh, language. And then you're sending them to your landing page. Okay. I did not know that. Oh, I know. I just thought of my other question. Um, when you're putting in your criteria to get that, like, what are you, what criteria do you look for? Are you doing age or income or what? You can't, um, because housing is considered a special category. You can't specify age or income. It comes oh. against fair housing and it, Facebook just won't let you do it. So what I've done, and I've tried all sorts of different variations of this. And with, so we were very specific when we had them in person because we only had so many seats, right? So I wanted to make sure that the most qualified people were showing up. Then with COVID, when we started doing them virtually, I tested all sorts of options because it was just less of like, if it was kind of a, a bust, it didn't matter as much. So we tested keeping it super broad and now we've gone back to being more specific. So what that looks like is we're putting in criteria for first time people that are first time home buyers, people that are interested in FHA loans. That's the first level. Then we're adding an additional layer of targeting based on what my ideal client profile is. So for you guys, it's all going to be different. And what I would suggest is think about who are the best first time buyer clients that you've worked with? What did they do for work? What did they, what were they interested in? And it doesn't have necessarily have to be someone that was like 
the most fun. It's like, who are, who are easy clients? Cause we want people to show up that are really learning based. They're going to be awesome to work with because you're going to have kind of like set them up for the whole transaction ahead of time. They're really going to trust you and they're going to be easy to work with. Um, and then what are their interests? What kind of things do they do? Have they been qualified financially? Like what kind of job do they have that they probably make enough money? So I've built out a client profile based on the people that I've worked with that I really, they were just easy to work with, well-qualified buyers. And for us, we have a lot of like biotech sciences. So it's a lot of my clientele, um, people that work in hospitals. We have a lot of that industry in this area, but for you guys, it's, it's all gonna be different. Um, okay. That is very helpful. Thank you for sharing that. One of the things that I love um, is that you, we get this often. I'm not from here. You know, I don't have a database here. I don't have a sphere here. How can I grow my business? I mean, you've grown a $40 million real estate business in a town where you knew nobody, right? Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not a social butterfly by any means. Like I hate networking events. Like I, <laughs> it gives me anxiety. <laughs> so is this truly your number one source of, of business? I would say up until this year, it has, I think we're yeah. now I'm kind of even with like agent Repeat. referrals. I yeah. get a lot of referrals We're we're actually getting a lot of referrals from these clients too. So we've implemented Mike Hicks, the promise. And so we're saying, Oh, I that. love that. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. tell people what that is for those that don't know. Um, I'm totally going to butcher it, but basically at the consultation, we're going through everything. And then we're saying at the end, Hey, there's one thing I would love from you, um, do you have another second? And they're going to say yes. Awesome. So our team has this promise and our goal is to deliver the absolute best experience that you could possibly imagine. We want you to be like totally wowed over the top. And I want you to know that everybody on our team is working to make this experience amazing for you. How does that sound? But amazing. Like who's going to say that sounds terrible, right? So um, I, I, there is one thing I'm going to ask from you. If you hear of anybody at all that's interested in buying real estate, selling real estate, even if they just have a question about real estate, could you put them in touch with me? And they're going to say, yeah, sure, of course. Awesome. And I just want you to be clear, like, can you put us in touch, not just like pass my name on, because I want to make sure that I have an opportunity to help them. Okay, great. So if we get to the closing and I haven't heard that uh, referral from you, anybody that we can help, I'm just going to assume that it's probably we could because we could have done something better. And we're such a feedback-based team. We're always working to be better. So I'm gonna ask you what we could have done better. Is that okay with you? Yes, great. And so you'll give me that that name of that person. Yes, awesome. Um, and we're, pro we're not like the best at following up on it at closing. We actually don't even attend closings anymore. So it makes it a little bit trickier, but um, what's happened is we've just, it's like puts the bug in their ear and we get so many referrals from our clients. One of my teammates. So I have one agent on my team. He has one client that came to a first time buyer seminar and she's referred us. She bought in January. She's referred us three pieces of business since then. Wow. And I actually, that was one of his first consultations on his own. It was like the last one we, we trained on together. And I was on that consultation. I specifically remember her saying like, I don't know. I think like all my friends and my coworkers have already bought, like, I can't think of anybody. I'm sorry. But if I think of someone, I will. She sent us three referrals that were all like $10,000 commissions. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Um, actually, can we pivot for one second and not and get off seminars, but and talk about experience with, are you guys doing, what are you doing to bring value to your clients? Are you creating any special experiences or, um, cause one of the things we've talked about today is being that, uh, that, that realtor that provides a true customer experience. Yeah. So, um, during the transaction, that's an area of opportunity for improvement for us. We aren't doing anything like over the top. We're just really trying to like communicate really well. Yeah. Um, but as far as like nurture for our database, we're doing, so our 36 touch, I just actually revamped it the other day. It's like 76 touches wow. for our, just for our regular database. And then our VIPs get like 116 touches. That's crazy. So what we're doing is quarterly giveaways. My database has loved this. So we've done three so far in the last like nine months. We did a Peloton giveaway. I saw that. Yeah. yeah people went nuts over that. 
we did um, this spring, we did a home makeover giveaway. So it was um, either a thousand dollar gift card to Crate and Barrel or Home Depot, the winner could choose. We got like 36 referrals from that. And then we, and I found out from that, that a bunch of my clients that had bought a couple of years ago are thinking of selling. Um, so it's just, it's also a good way to kind of see where your database is at temperature wise without yeah. having to be obviously in their face about it. Did, and did then, I, how do they register? Yeah. So the, the Peloton giveaway, we had them call in. Okay. I honestly probably won't do that again. A couple okay. of reasons. It's just, it's a lot of like manpower to have them call in. We had to have everybody like manning the phones all day. We're like, we missed a call from this person, call them back. People won't leave their their um, names in a voice note because they want to make sure that they talk to somebody and get entered. And so it was just, it was so much work to get everybody entered. Yeah. We, um, we use Brevity as our database and through Brevity, we have a service called Quickly and it's, you get a code and it like, you can have them text home makeover to 59559. Yeah. And then we set it up that when they text that number, it would send them a link to a Google form to complete their entry. And then on the Google form, you can ask them whatever you want. So we were getting their updated contact information. Um, do you love your home? Have you thought about buying, selling, investing in real estate? A ton of my clients want to invest. So we're actually going to put together an, an investor seminar. Love um, that. Who do you know? So we, we kind of gamified it. It was like extra entries. If you know someone that we can help with real estate. So they get like five extra entries and people get really competitive about it because they, if it's a high ticket item, they're like, I want that Peloton. I am going to go find people to refer. Yeah. Um, and what I liked about doing the text in actually was we gave them kind of a two week window. So instead yeah. of having to be like, okay, you have to call on this date. It was like, Hey, have you entered yet? Have you entered yet? And then if they think of another referral in that two week time, they can enter again, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, and then I love that. most recently we did like a trigger smoker for father's. Oh yeah. Perfect. I saw, yeah, I saw that too. I love that so much. Um, okay. We have less than one minute left and I think another zoom is starting on this. I just found out, uh, Linda and Press's profit share. So really quickly, uh, thank you guys so much. Um, hold on Kimberly, really quickly. Are the followers coming from your database or social media or both for the giveaways? Um, both. I okay. actually was surprised at how many people saw it just on my social media. And a lot of my clients are following me on Instagram now. So love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Oh my gosh. Okay. We have, how do, how can they follow you or, or find uh, you, contact you? The best way is probably on Instagram. I can type all my contact info in. And then if anybody has any specific questions, I know we kind of were all over the place and got cut off. Feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm going to put my contact information in the chat and then happy to answer any questions. Yes. Thank you so much for doing that.